Okay. <laughs> um, so next month we have on July 14th, we have our first international or in in trans transcontinental meeting with David Higgins, who is an expert on clay pipes. And um, clay pipes is one of my favorite things to find because you can, it, you can learn so much from a pipe. You can learn how, who bought it, who made it, what year it was, how the trade patterns were and things like that. So I think that's gonna be a great meeting. Um, in August, on August the 18th, we have our own Dr. Lisa Krause and Jason Schellenhammer talking about the Cocker's Houses in Baltimore. If you have not heard them talk about this yet, it is a fascinating topic. Um, I think they've really uncovered some history that has been uh, lost to time. So uh, make sure that you show up for that on the Cocker's Houses. And in August, we're going to have our very first in-person meeting since March of 2020. And we are going to be doing um, artifact cleaning and cataloging. And I hope to get done the Glen Ellen collection. Um, I think Jason's going to have some from different projects. So there'll be plenty to do. Now, we do have to limit it to 20 people. So if you're interested, make sure that you go ahead and register for that. Um, I'm not sure if this is going to be September or October yet. I need to. Uh, uh, get a date um, down with Dr. Britton, but um, he will be talking about the Irish immigrants of Texas, Maryland, and that's a fascinating topic in itself. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with the Cockeysville area, um, Texas used to be a part of the, the quarry. All of that was part of the uh, a huge Irish wave of immigrants that happened in 1847, 1848. That was part of the potato famine and also part of um, where they were kicked off of the land. So um, that's, real, that's a really interesting topic as well. And I forgot to put this on the slide, but this is gonna be another in-person event. I think it's gonna be October 9th, but we'll certainly let you know what the date's gonna be. We will have a pontoon boat tour of Jug Bay. Um, they usually do that once in the summer and I asked if they would do it just for our club and they said they would. They Again, they have to limit it to 20 people just because of the size of the boat. But um, I think that'll be a very cool event as well. And for November, for Thanksgiving er, time frame, we are gonna have Henry Ward. You guys might be familiar with him. He's going to talk to us about, uh, he's actually gonna give us a cooking demonstration and talk to us about indigenous foods and native cuisine of the Chesapeake Bay region. And the um, Adrian talked about this. This is this month's raffle. It's only five dollars. So there's some beautiful, beautiful things here. And Adrian talked about it more in depth because he has way more knowledge about it than I do. Um, just to remind you, these are our social media sites if you want to follow us on here. And we also have the Red Bubble site. It still has some of the cicada mandalas on there. So if you want those, if you're if you're missing the cicadas, now's your chance to to get your, I have the uh, mask, so that's pretty cool. Let me stop sharing that. And I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. I'm very um, pleased that he could speak with us. It's Dr. Zachary Singer, and he received his PhD from the University of Connecticut in 2017. Zach is a research archeologist for the Maryland Historical Trust. His research interests include Eastern North American archaeology, Paleo-Indian lithic technology, three-dimensional digital modeling of artifacts, and geophysical remote sensing. And tonight he's going to talk to us, he's going to give us an overview of the Paleo-Indian period in Maryland based on the data from the statewide Maryland Fluted Point Survey. So if you want to start sharing now, Zach, feel free. I'm going to mute myself. Well, thanks, Ilka, for inviting me to speak tonight to the Natural History Society, the Archaeology Club. Uh, can everyone hear me all right and see my presentation? Cool. Thanks for shaking your head. Uh, and thanks for the people who, who came on such a wonderful night. I know it's really beautiful outside, so I appreciate you uh, spending your time inside listening uh, to my talk. Uh, so again, I'm Zach Singer. I'm the research archaeologist at the Maryland Historical Trust. I've been there for about a year and a half. Uh, 
doing all sorts of uh, fun things, remote sensing, uh, using ground penetrating radar uh, to find buried historic structures and some uh, prehistoric uh, structures, which is pretty cool. Uh, I'm also in charge of the archaeological synthesis database. And so uh, if you haven't seen that, it's it collates and provides public access to all of the phase two and phase three archaeological studies in Maryland. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about archaeological sites in Maryland, it's a great resource. Um, but the other thing that I was really excited to do when I when I became the research archaeologist at the Maryland Historical Trust was to restart the Maryland Fluted Point Survey. Uh, my dissertation research was on Paleo Indian archaeology in Eastern North America, uh, specifically in New England. Uh, but I'm from Maryland, and I always wanted to have my career in Maryland. So I was really fortunate, and uh, I still am fortunate to uh, now be in Maryland uh, as an archaeologist. And so when I when I got this job with the Historical Trust, I said one thing I really really want to do is restart the Maryland Fluted Point Survey. And so uh, that's the topic I'm going to going to discuss tonight is the Maryland Fluted Point Survey and what we can learn about the Paleo-Indian Paleo occupation of Maryland, which is between 13,000 years ago and 10,000 years ago. Uh, so I guess first off, looking at the photo on the title screen, when most people think about Paleo-Indians, I think this is kind of the base idea that we think about. And that's hunter-gatherers who hunt big game. So in this case, you see a group of Paleo Indians throwing uh, spears at a mastodon or a mammoth. I don't know which, probably a mammoth. And so that's usually what we think about. Uh, and so that kind of brings up a few ideas. One, there aren't any mastodons or mammoths around today. So that show, talks about the antiquity of these people. They're here at the end of the last ice age before when these megafauna were still running around before they went extinct. Uh, but the other thing, that at least I always think about is how we can study these people archeologically. And the way we do that is through the material culture that they left behind. Since most things, most organic materials rot away over time, especially in the acidic soils of Maryland, the primary thing that we have to study these people from so long ago are their stone tools because the stone typically is, stays well-preserved. And so if you look at this image of these Paleo Indians hunting this mammoth, you can see that they're wearing organic, they're wearing hide clothing. They have, uh, they have these spears and there's wood on those spear, uh, wood shafts. And then they're uh, using some sort of sinew probably to tie these stone points onto that sinew, uh, onto the shaft. Archaeologically, all we'll get from what might be a mammoth or mastodon hunt would be just the most likely just those bone tips. So we're seeing one very small piece of this whole uh, whole life of these people. And we use that little bit of evidence to try to learn more about how these people lived and how they organized their campsites and how they moved around Maryland, so on and so forth. So that, that's what we'll talk about tonight. So just as a kind of basic overview, and I, most of my slides aren't this wordy, but this is just kind of my definition. So we're all on the same page before we get, get too far and people don't know what I'm talking about. So who are the Paleo Indians? The Paleo Indians are the oldest well-documented archeological culture tradition in East North America. And those sites date to around 13,000 years ago. Uh, there is some evidence that is increasing daily for older occupations. Sometimes people call them pre-Clovis occupations or older than Clovis occupations. And there's more and more evidence that there's likely people here before Paleo-Indians, or at least the, the well-documented ones at 13,000 years ago. Uh, but nevertheless, if we want to study cultural traditions across space, the, the most well-documented and earliest occupation are Paleo-Indian occupations. So what does this word Paleo-Indian mean? It's an, it's an archeological name, meaning old Indians, right? Paleo is Greek. So all it means is old Indians. Uh, and it was coined in the 1940s. So when I say Paleo-Indians, that's not what these people would have referred to themselves as. It's how archeologists archeolo recognize them based on uh, their, mostly their stone toolkit. 
So when I use Paleo Indians, I'm referring to the well-documented people who lived in Maryland and elsewhere uh, during the terminal Pleistocene and early Holocene. So from 13,000 to 10,000 calendar years before present. And again, the way we recognize Paleo Indians in the archeological record is mostly by their stone toolkit because that's what's preserved. And so that includes lancelet shaped projectile points that tend to be fluted or collaterally flaked. And also there are other kind of scraping tools. So unificial scrapers and, and gravers, which are uh, these little tiny point, uh, little tiny kind of projections that are likely used uh, to make small holes for, uh, for stitching clothing. So again, here you can see on the left, this photo of, a, not a photo, a painting of, uh, a reconstruction of a Paleo-Indian campsite. So here you see a family that is uh, butchering caribou and making their tailored hide clothing out of the caribou. Uh, and you can see they're hanging some meat probably to, to dry and uh, be able to transport around. And in the background, you can see what, uh, what one of their uh, homes might have looked like. So it's got this hide uh, that hides over sticks to make some sort of uh, circular or oblong dwelling. But again, what we find archaeologically is mostly just the stone tools, and maybe if we're lucky, some features like the, the posts where those uh, that would have held that, um, that house together. And those features would just be the stains from those posts. All right, so now that we're, we all know what I talk about when I mean Paleo Indians, the next thing we need to know is what is a fluted point? So this is the diagnostic artifact. This is the hunting tool that Paleo Indians made. And the way we recognize it is the flute on a fluted point. And so here is an image of a fluted point. And here, hopefully you can see, I've outlined what the flute is in kind of reddish pink. So the flute is a removal from the base towards the tip of this projectile point, which is assumed to be used as a way to haft the, the stone point onto a foreshaft as part of this composite hunting technology. So the flute thins that stone point, then some sort of uh, bone or wood foreshaft is inserted or kind of laid onto that thinned area. And then that would be tied with some sort of sinew and mastic to hold that stone point onto uh, the, onto the, the shaft of what's likely a projected dart or an atlatl. But the styles of these fluted points changed through time from 13,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. And so we can use that change in time to help recognize different cultural traditions. So here you can see two examples. On the left is a Clovis point, and it's, again, it's just a, a drawing. And on the right is a Folsom point. But you can see pretty drastically the different length of the flutes. So on Clovis, it's less than halfway up the point. And on Folsom, it's going all the way through the tip. So that's a very easy thing to recognize in a, in a stone projectile point. And it has something to do with, uh, with a change in the idea of the best way to half one of these stone points onto a, onto a, a foreshaft. So building on that idea, here's just a, some different examples of of uh, Paleo-Indian points that are hafted. Uh, so going from Clovis to Folsom to uh, collaterally flaked points that are no longer fluted like Scott's Bluff and Agate Basin to then uh, these Dalton points, which are more tri uh, triangular in outline. And when we think about fluted points and change through time, it's again, what's happening is there's a change in the what people think is the best way to tie their projectile to their foreshaft. And we know that styles change through time, right? You can look at this woman here with her, maybe it's Farrah Fawcett, with her hairdo and with her bell bottom jeans and with her skateboard. And we can tell that's not the present day, right? Because we today think that there's a different way to be fashionable. But in the seventies, this was the fashionable way. Similarly, look at this, the difference in the genes from Brad Pitt in, 19, in the 90s. So we have from the 70s, these long bell-bottom genes. In the 90s, we have these straight leg genes. And then today, we have these super baggy genes again. So if we just take something as simple as 
how we like to keep our legs warm wearing pants. You can see change through time from bell bottoms to straight legs to now these super baggy things. But that doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other, right? Or, so I don't think of the change in fluted point technology as being cultural evolution from worse towards better. It's just a different way that people thought was the best way to, to do something. So that's kind of how I think about it. We can look at change through time in clothing and think about change through time in projectile points and don't always equate newer as better. But how do these fluted points get found? So the exciting thing is that sometimes they're fortuitously found, so randomly. People are out just enjoying themselves in, every day, in their everyday life and stumble across a 13,000 year old artifact. So here's an example from the Smithsonian Magazine from 2014. Uh, a young fellow was boogie boarding in New Jersey, probably in Ocean City, and thought he got bit by a crab. He felt something on his foot. So he bent down to see what had bit him, and lo and behold, he picks up this 13,000 year old stone projectile point, a Clovis point. So a random chance fortuitous occurrence. So uh, people who are on this call, you could be out gardening in your backyard, you could be out hiking, doing all sorts of activities and perhaps stumble upon a, a prehistoric artifact, um, which is really cool and really exciting. And at the end of this talk, I'm gonna talk about ways that you can help uh, spread awareness for those, those chance fortuitous discoveries. Um, but so that's, this is one great example. Um, and maybe when people are in, enjoying themselves in Ocean City this year, Ocean City, Maryland, they might uh, get so lucky. Here is the distribution of Clovis points across North America. And this is from the Paleo-Indian database of the Americas. So they've, in, in this database, there are about 12,000. I'm sure there's more now. This is from 2010, so it's a little outdated. So these are about 12,000 Clovis points that have been documented and reported uh, to the Paleo-Indian database of the Americas. And many of these, again, were found by people who just stumbled onto them. Others were found by collectors who their hobby was to go find projectile points. And then uh, additionally, other ones were found by research archeologists who are uh, actively looking for these old sites. Uh, and then the kind of last way these thing, things are found is through uh, development uh, of properties and cultural resource management. So contract archeology. span but you can see this distribution is interesting. It looks like there are many more Clovis points in Eastern North America than there are in Central or Western North America. And so there's always a question of what is causing this pattern? Why do we see many more fluted points in the East than we do the West? And some people have used this evidence to argue that maybe fluted point technology was invented in Eastern North America. So there's greater time depth, meaning that there could be more fluted points found and all told that's, that's what this pattern is showing. Um, and maybe that's true, but other researchers have argued, and this is kind of what I think, uh, is that their present population density is greater in Eastern North America. And so what this pattern is really reflecting is that there are more people finding, present day people finding fluted points in Eastern North America, because there are more universities running field schools, there's more development, so there's more cultural resource management excavations. Uh, there's more people plowing fields and walking those fields and finding these artifacts. And so I think this distribution likely at least partially reflects modern population density uh, and how much it reflects the prehistoric population density is kind of still up in the air. Uh, so zooming in, when people talk about Paleo-Indian, sometimes you people kind of mention in a very broad way. So everything is a Clovis point. Uh, but if nowadays Paleo-Indian archaeologists have regionalized the studies, and so I'll show you kind of what that looks like. Here is Eastern North America, and so we're looking at the Southeast, the Mid-Atlantic, the Northeast, and the Great Lakes, and from, from oldest to youngest, oldest at the bottom, youngest to the top. Uh, and so there are general trends in fluted point technology, uh, but people call them different things because they've regionalized them. So there are local archaeological sites that have defined these different point types. Uh, but the general trend that you'll see here is the 13,000 year old points tend to be uh, broad, parallel sided, and have flutes that run 
a third or halfway up the point. Then at 12,000 years ago, you start getting these fish-tailed points and the flutes go up to the tip of the point. And then by 11,000 years ago, the points tend to be unfluted or just, or just minimally fluted and they're more collaterally flaked. So instead they have uh, flakes coming from each side meeting in the middle. So these broad, these broad kind of cultural changes happen all throughout the, um, the, the East. And I'll, I'll get more into the Middle Atlantic types coming up. Here is a just kind of brief overview of the Paleo-Indian sites that have been documented in the Mid-Atlantic. So met the ones that I've listed out on the right, uh, most of those are in Maryland, some are in Virginia. Uh, so there are a handful of fluted point sites, meaning sites that have produced many fluted points or a whole suite of Paleo-Indian artifacts. Uh, but additionally, there are many isolated Paleo-Indian fluted points that likely are evidence for sites that have not yet been confirmed through additional research. Before we get into talk about artifacts, since this is the Natural History Museum after all, we need to know about placing these people on the landscape. So what did it look like in Maryland 13,000 years ago? Very different than today. So something we always have to keep in mind is that we can't just look outside and assume that what we're seeing today exactly correlates to times deep in the past. Uh, so at, so at 13,000 years ago, when these paleo Indians are, are hanging out in Maryland, it's the end of the last ice age. There's, you can see a large, uh, the Laurentide ice sheet in Canada that is sucking up a lot of water. That's what ice is made out of. And so since ice holds water, sea levels drop. And so as you can look at Maryland, the what is the present day bay is not a bay 13,000 years ago. And the Atlantic coast where Ocean City is would have also been dry land and, and the coast would have been further out due to the lower sea levels. There's also some really cool things in, in the Northeast. So you can see the Champlain Sea, which is, which is an inland sea in Northern uh, New York and Vermont. They found, someone was talking about fossils earlier. They found fossils of whales and seals in Vermont. Pretty cool. You wouldn't find those today. Um, so the, the landscape is very different 13,000 years ago, and it's something we have to always keep in mind when we're finding and discussing paleo Indian archaeology in Maryland. The way that people try to reconstruct what the environment might have looked like is through using uh, pollen cores, typically from swamps. So uh, there's one from Virginia there, that the Hack Pond one on the top left. Uh, and then there's the New England, there was a, a publication in 2005 that did a great job of showing uh, broad trends in pollen data for the, for the Northeast at 13,000 years ago. And then uh, the Indian Creek site in Prince George's County, I don't have a pretty map, but I summarized it on the bottom left. Uh, the, the things to look at kind of in the broad trend is things are colder 13,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Spruce is more widespread as is pine. So top left is the spruce percentages and bottom right is the pine percentages. And we're seeing just kind of the north tip of New Jersey in those images on the, on the, from the newbie at all. Um, but if we extrapolate with that Hack Pond data and with the Indian Creek data, it's likely that Maryland was mostly a boreal forest, meaning more like what we would see in, in Canada today. So a boreal forest of pine and spruce and fir, that would be kind of what it looked like here from thir at around 13,000 years ago. And then after 10,000 years ago, the, it's replaced with a deciduous forest of oak and hickory. So more like what we see at present. Again, talking about sea level and the, the lowered sea level when Paleo-Indians were here, the bay did not exist. It was the ancestral Susquehanna. So if you're finding Paleo-Indian archeological sites eroding out onto the bay at present, they were inland upland sites 13,000 years ago. And they're now being encroached by rising sea level and being impacted by daily, and daily erosion from, uh, from wave energy. The other thing that is pretty wild for the Mid-Atlantic is that 13, at, around 12,900 years ago when the Younger Dryas occurs, the environment gets pretty dry. And so the wind picks up all these uh, 
silt and sand particles and blows them around. And so there's these thick lust deposits uh, along the along the bay. And you can see the picture on the right that are that yellowy soil above the dark soil. That's all that lust that's capping that 13,000 year old living surface. So if you're trying to find Clovis sites around the bay and you're walking plowed fields, some of those fields won't have the, the sites will be still deeply buried by this lust package by the by that uh, that windblown sand. And so the 13,000 year old living service where paleoindians were living again is, is below that yellow layer. And above that layer would be where you'd find all the more recent artifacts. Which, and that wind, that windblown sand means it was probably pretty dusty in the mid-Atlantic. The other thing that I think a lot about, and this is something I'd love to talk to the, the, uh, the fossil club about uh, in more detail, is again, the things that we have for studying Paleo-Indians in the past are their stone tools. And so we have to think a lot about geology and where Paleo-Indians might have accessed these stones and how they're transporting around the landscape. So here's just showing some of the different areas where, where stones were collected and uh, accessible to Paleo-Indians. Uh, again, knowing that the bay did not exist in present. So there could be resources that are now submerged that Paleo-Indians were able to access 13,000 years ago that we can't at present. So I'll talk about some of these in a little more detail. So in Delmarva, there are all of these uh, cobble deposits and so these are things that were brought down the ancestral Susquehanna. And so they're eroded from places further north. And there are many cherts, which are a crypto crystalline stone, uh, basically silicon dioxide, which are easy to, to make stone tools out of. They're, they're easy to have a controlled fracture and they're highly prized by Paleo Indians and, and tend to be used widely. And, uh, and when they're available, they tend to be preferred because it's a, a very nice stone that's easy to make, rel to, to, it's reliable to make stone tools out of. Uh, but you can find them locally in these cobble beds along Delmarva. So when you find them, it doesn't mean that you can track it down to a bedrock outcrop source. You can track them to these secondary cobble sources. Other, other types of stone that do have outcrop sources along uh, Delmarva are uh, solidified sandstones, uh, different quartzites, there's this large green ortho quartzite at the bottom, figure 59. Uh, and there's coastal plain cherts that do outcrop as well as petrified wood. So there are outcrop sources that paleo Indians frequented and made stone tools out of. And then we also see in the mid-Atlantic, we see types of stone that are coming from outside of Maryland that are transported to the region by paleo Indians, likely as they're moving around the landscape uh, in their seasonal rounds. So we see Norman Skill Chert from south of Albany that gets moved to the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, there are Jat, so that's the top left. There are Jaspers, which is a yellow chert. Uh, there are multiple sources, uh, the Iron Hill Jasper in kind of the head of the bay, uh, Flint Run Jasper in Virginia, and the Hardyston Formation Jasper in eastern Pennsylvania, all of which likely are transported to Maryland. And then there's this weathering amber chalcedony, which is a really interesting stone uh, that I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. There's a, a Clovis quarry site of this material in Eastern Virginia. And there's also interestingly enough, what seems to be another quarry site in Reisterstown, Maryland. So my best guess is that this stone is some sort of uh, fault zone chalcedony, but I would uh, be very interested if people have, have seen this stone and know more about it. All right, so all that being said, those are kind of the baseline in information that I have to think about when trying to interpret the Maryland Fluted Point Survey. And the Maryland Fluted Point Survey was originated in 1979 uh, by, by Lois Brown, uh, who did this research uh, as, uh, did this research in collaboration with the Maryland Historical Trust. And um, when she was done with the research, she uh, left all of those materials at the trust. And so what Lois was doing was she was, See, sending out calls for people to uh, to report fluted points that they had found around Maryland. And then she would go and document those, those points. And so you can see her projectile point analysis form. She was measuring different attributes of these fluted points and then also photographing them. And using that as well as the documenting the location where these materials, where the artifacts were found 
to uh, study Paleo-Indian archaeology in Maryland. So here's an example of one of these completed forms. So she's got a slide uh, of the fluted point and she has the measurements as well as whose collection the material came from. And all of this information is still at the Maryland Historical Trust, uh, which I was very excited to access and continue to study. Uh, and all of her slides, uh, there aren't, I don't know how many young people are on here, but uh, not things used to not be digital. And so I've just recently digitized all of these slides, uh, which was a, a fun process, uh, but now they're more accessible um, and preserved forever digitally. So Lois's uh, study, she mapped all of the fluted points that she had documented and uh, she identified them by, by different cultural traditions using Bill Gardner's typology. So that it, you can see there are three types. Clovis, which would be the earliest middle Paleo-Indian, again, in the middle, and then Hardaway Dalton, which would be the latest type uh, in terms of time. And she plotted them across the state. And you can use her distributions to compare with things like fossils to perhaps think about where Paleo-Indian archaeological sites are in relation to fossil-bearing sites. And we know there is some overlap between the, these megafauna and Paleo-Indians 13,000 years ago. But many of these fossil sites are probably much older than those Paleo-Indian occupations. So it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but uh, something to consider uh, for potential overlap between Paleo-Indians and, and animals, extinct, now extinct animals that they may have hunted. So getting into my thoughts about the Paleo-Indian, the, the Maryland Fluted Point Survey and the types of fluted points represented in the survey, Again, Lois Brown and, and still in, in Maryland Archaeology Month poster in 2013, uh, the way that people in the Mid-Atlantic tend to organize fluted points is with Bill Gardner's typology, which is that there are three types. There are Clovis points, which are the oldest, Middle Paleo-Indian, which are in the middle, and then Hardaway Dalton, which are the youngest. And this is based on Bill Gardner's work at, at Thunderbird and the Flint Run sites in Virginia. And here you can see the artifacts that he used to define those types. There are Clovis points on the left, the kind of upper row are his mid paleo points, and then the bottom row are his Hardaway dog points. There aren't very many. And these are from a quarry site, meaning that typically what you're finding are the things that were broken in production and rejected. They're not the artifacts that were made to the template that was wanted and carried off to be used in other places. So getting back to this typology, you can see the Mid-Atlantic's pretty sparse. We don't have any named types. They were using Jack Renischke's uh, typology from 1994. Uh, but these other areas like the Northeast and the Great Lakes more recently redefined the styles of fluted points that they found or could be found uh, based on local sites. And there are many more uh, types present in the Northeast and the Great Lakes. Uh, well, as was mentioned, I did my dissertation research on Northeastern Paleo-Indian archeology. span And so when I moved back to the Mid-Atlantic, I was uh, seeing all of this variability in the fluted point types in the Mid-Atlantic that was being lumped together by using Bill Gardner's typology. And so I'll, I'll show you that. Um, again, here's the New England typology for, the, for Northeastern North America and compare that to Maryland. So in Northeastern North America, there are many more types to represent the people who were in that region from about 13,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. And in the Mid-Atlantic, that's lumped into three types. Uh, so coming from this Northeastern background, I have reanalyzed the Maryland Fluted Point Survey, Lois Brown's uh, Fluted Point Survey, to look at how much variability might actually be present in there. And there's much. So here are Clovis points. These points are, these are the oldest, they're 13,000 years old. They're recognized by the uh, very shallow basal concavities and their short flutes. And you can see the, a variety of raw materials present. Quartz, quartzite, weathering amber, chalcedony, jasper. There are gainy-like points. These are a little bit younger. These have a deeper basal concavity and still have flutes that go about halfway up the point. Uh, even So we're going from oldest to youngest. So as I move advanced slides, we're getting younger and younger in time. 
There are redstone-like or veil de burt like points. These have even deeper basal concavities. So you see how deep the ears are. There's a big U in the, in the bottom now. Uh, and the flutes tend to be about halfway or longer on the points. There are barns-like points. These are about 12,000 years, years old. You can see the ears on these points. Now they have these kind of fishtail and the flutes tend to extend up to or past the tip. So very long flutes. Crowfield-like points, these are a little bit younger, uh, a little bit younger than 12,000 or around 12,000 years old. These have these expand from the base towards the midsection, so they look kind of like a pumpkin seed shape and tend to be multiply fluted with long flutes. And there are many late Paleo-Indian types as well, including these Hardaway Dalton-like points, which are more trianguloid in outline. They're weakly fluted. They can have serrations, like you see that one uh, in the middle. Uh, has those kind of spiky projections or serrations on it. And there are uh, agate basin-like points, which are collaterally flaked. So they're, it's not fluted. Instead, there are flakes coming from each side and meeting towards the center. So by looking at the materials that Lois Brown had documented in, in the 70s and, 80, and early 80s, uh, she was lumping this fluted point technology into three types based on the based on the archaeological tradition at the time to do that based on Bill Gardner's work. Um, but this is why curating artifacts and uh, records is so important. We can reanalyze these ideas with as ideas change about how to best uh, sort and identify different different cultures through time and now have recognized that it seems that there's much more uh, variability in the Maryland fluted point assemblage showing that uh, that cultural time depth and, uh, and nuances from 13,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. Um, so all told, here's my reanalysis, looking at uh, Lois Brown in the, up, in the top part and mine in the bottom part. So I've, I've pulled out uh, those three types and made it uh, into a, additional types that I think better represent uh, the fluted point types in Maryland. And I've put all this uh, data into a GIS system so that I can um, manipulate it in, in, uh, in space and uh, have it preserved again digitally. So here you can see it uh, uh, separated uh, through space. So zooming in, your location is that uh, the blue square, I'm uh, sorry, blue star. And here are the, your kind of localish Point. So there are four. There, the Barnes point is a triangle that's hidden behind the red point. So here are your local points. Uh, nearby, there are two fluted points from the Higgins site, which is near BWI. Uh, that's a, a well excavated Paleo Indian site that yielded a whole suite of stone tools associated with the Paleo Indian occupation. Uh, there's a Dalton point that was recently found and reported to me from Patapsco Valley State Park. Uh, so that's a late Paleo Indian point. And then there are two points uh, from Baltimore County the, that were documented by Lois Brown. One is a 12,000 year old Barnes point, which is that you can see those fish tailed ears. And the other is a redstone point with that very deep basal concavity. Uh, so those are kind of your local points. And uh, uh, we're seeing time depth from Clovis, which is 13,000 years ago to Barnes, which is 12,000 years ago to Dalton, which is 11,000 years ago. So Paleo Indians were hanging out around Baltimore County uh, for, a, for their whole history. And hopefully uh, there are additional points that will be found and documented in the future. So ways forward, uh, the survey is still active and open. Uh, I, one thing I plan on doing, which I haven't done yet, is uh, going back through Lois's well-documented uh, files and, and digitizing all of the measurements so I've digitized all of the slides, but I need to still uh, make some sort of database for her measurements. And that'll be, be useful for, again, uh, better documenting this, this cultural variability in the fluted point types through uh, time and space in Maryland. There are many additional points that people know about that I'm hoping they will uh, submit to me and submit to the Maryland Fluted Point Survey. Uh, so for instance, Darren Lowry has documented 115 fluted points in Delmarva. Uh, and so I keep asking and hopefully he, and he, he does share his data, but I keep asking for him to keep sharing his data 
uh, so that we can add all of those polluted points to the Maryland polluted point circle. Uh, additionally, there are many old collections which are just waiting for a, an enthusiastic archaeologist to look through to find additional data. So here's an example from the Ogle collection, which the Anne Arundel County Cultural Resources Division is currently uh, studying and analyzing. Bob Ogle was a, a very productive artifact collector in the, uh, in the 70s and 80s. And before he died, he donated his artifacts to Anne Arundel County. And he, he kept meticulous notes. So these artifacts are known to which sites they came from. Um, but they were in these coffee cans. And now archaeologists uh, with Anne Arundel County's Cultural Resources Division are dumping through these cans and sorting uh, the artifacts and taking them up to modern collection standards. And they found many fluted points in the collection, some of which Bob had known about, uh, but others that he hadn't recognized because he had such a large collection, not everyone was identified uh, properly at the time. And so here is just a, a handful of the Ogle fluted points. Um, there are more, including one that was, was emailed to me today from this collection that was just found and recognized. So there are many old collections all across the state of Maryland that would be worthy of additional analysis to see if fluted points are in those uh, collections. And then you can contribute to this survey. Uh, so if you know of artifacts in your collection or in someone else's collection or in a, in a historical society or what have you, uh, that you want to provide further information to the Maryland Historical Trust, you can now do that very easily through the MD Find app. So uh, my colleague, uh, the chief archaeologist Matt McKnight and I created this app in and it's uh, in Survey One Two Three. So it's readily accessible either through a web browser or you can download the Survey One Two Three app onto a smartphone. And if you click that link that is here, uh, you can download our Maryland Find app, and it has very simple instructions for how to submit artifacts that you found or that you want to report. And uh, so you'll, you can submit photos of those artifacts as well as the location where you found them and some basic information. Uh, you can remain anonymous if you'd like, or you can send me your contact information or submit your contact information so that uh, we could contact you to have some follow-up discussions. So uh, you can do this for fluted points, which is what gets me really excited, or for any artifact that you happen to discover while you're out hiking in the woods or looking for fossils or whatever. Um, if you find an artifact, you can take a photo of it right there in the field and submit it on your smartphone, or you can keep track of where you found it and submit it when you get back to your desktop or your, by using a web browser. Um, so that would be uh, really great to help collaborate on the Maryland Fluted Point Survey, but also just learning more about artifacts that are being found across Maryland. So here you can see two that were reported this month. One was reported uh, in early June, and the other was just reported today from the Ogle Collection. Uh, so that was very exciting. And, and fluted points are still being found and are in these collections just waiting to be rediscovered. Uh, so with that, if you want more information about archaeology in Maryland, you can visit the Maryland Historical Trust website, which is at the top. Or if you have uh, additional questions or you'd like to contact me personally, there's my email address, zachary.singer at maryland.gov. Um, there's also a blog post about MD Find if you want more information about how to submit uh, your artifact discoveries to MD Find. Uh, there's a blog, so there's the link there. Um, but if you go into a Google search and type in MD Find, MHT or Maryland Historical Trust, it'll lead you to the blog. And so with that, uh, thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. This is very fascinating. I had a question. How how do I want to phrase it? How much do you think the app will be able to expand the, the knowledge or the database of the fluted points in Maryland? Just as again, I know you don't know, but it it's all about it's all about buy-in from the public. So there are many collect many people whose hobby it is to go collect artifacts. And I hope that they will be willing to share that information of where they found their artifacts to help expand the database. And, and some people have so far, and, and the database is growing daily, um, but it, it all depends on public buy-in. And so we've tried to make the, the, the app very easy and accessible. It's, a, it's really quick to complete. You can do it from a, any internet, any web browser or a smartphone. Um, 
So it's just hoping that uh, people who have an interest and have, have found these artifacts are willing to share the data that they have. And by doing so, it helps us learn more about Maryland's history. So I hope people will continue to grow the database and continue to expand its usership. I don't think I see any questions in the chat. If people wanna just chime in, feel free. I actually, I have a question. Um, oh, whoops, I didn't raise my hand. Um, <laughs> someone else did. <laughs> Am I jumping ahead? I feel like there's Reed, Rita. Did you wanna go first and I'll go after you? Yeah. Okay. Sure, I got a quick question. Uh, this is Gene Meyer. I noticed that a lot of the more recent photographs are very clear showing the sculpting uh, uh, on the surfaces like the ones that you've got uh, there. And it's something that I thought about because uh, in grad school, one of my jobs was uh, uh, photographing uh, 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 geological uh, things. And I was wondering how you set up the light source so that you have you know, you show that, you see that, that, that surface detail so well, whereas if you use something like a ring light, like they use in, in, in dentistry, you lose all that surface detail. Uh, so, I mean, it just depends. I mean, iPhones nowadays are pretty good at getting photos if you have natural sunlight. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if I'm in the lab, I just set up, I have like a, a copy stand. And so I'll just set up uh, light sources to create raking light from the sides, uh, like oblique angles, and mm -hmm. just keep moving those lights around until it's picking up the flake scar as well. Um, so it, it is easy to over like oversaturate the light and then you wash everything out. But if you play around with it enough and get oblique angles, you can pick up the flake scars. Yeah, that, that, that's great. So it's raking light. And then uh, there was a work from quite a while ago showing that if the light came from the top left, of the artifact, uh, artifact or in, uh, uh, in um, of a landscape, then people read the hills and the valleys accurately. And if the light comes from the bottom right, people tend to reverse reading so that hills are read as uh, 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 cups or depressions. Interesting. So, but but you you're doing is you're turning the uh, uh, artifact around or moving the lights around so that you show the detail that you want to see. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm just trying to pick out the most flake scars as I can. I haven't just, I haven't made it so it's always coming from the top left or anything like that. It's just right. however to, to best exemplify the flaking. Right. So what you're doing is the most informative. All right. And then Ilya was so, was, was so uh, a good natured and courteous and I, you know, she had a question right at the same time that I did. Oops, okay, here we go. I had to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I just had a quick question about maybe state and national parks um, and sort of the relationship they have with the public and sharing your, um, your you know, insight, this connection for sharing finds and whatnot. Um, you know, if people are going outside more, maybe they're not finding things at their homes, but if they're going out on a walk, um, you know, just what's going on with that. Have you been able to work with um, those groups to be able to promote, better promote doing a survey? Uh, so through the Maryland Historical Trust, we, I mean, we've promoted it ourselves. We haven't, I don't think, reached out to like the Department of Natural Resources or anything to ask them to promote it. Um, so we're trying to do it through our social media, um, but certainly if people are, are anywhere in Maryland and they and they find an artifact, uh, you could take a photo of it and, and submit it to empty find. Uh, if it's on your personal property, on your private property, uh, in, in America, you own what's in the ground. So you own those artifacts. If you're on state property or federal property, the things in the ground belong to the state or the federal government. So I would, uh, you shouldn't, pick up or remove artifacts from state or federal property. But if you stumble onto something and take a photograph of it to report it, that would be very helpful. Thank you. 
Okay, we have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, one is, do you think people were in present day Maryland first and may have traveled to present day Northeast? Does your dual research support this? Yes, because there were ice sheets that were uh, down to Long Island. Uh, so because of that, likely people are in, it's whether there are pre-Clovis people in Maryland or not is still an open question. And there's some, some decent research like at the Parsons Island site or some good research at the Parsons Island site, which seems to suggest that there are people in Maryland perhaps much before Clovis people. How those pre-Clovis sites relate to Clovis culture is currently unclear. So again, the, the best well-documented sites in Maryland are about 13,000 years old. And it seems that the sites in the Northeast are a little bit younger, like 12,900 years old. Not, that's not much, right? But the argument is always that probably people are in the Mid-Atlantic a little bit before the Northeast because the Northeast is, is uh, rebounding and, and kind of being re-inhabited after deglaciation. And Maryland didn't have to deal with that because the, the Laurentide didn't make it down this far. Okay, and I think I'm go gonna give you one more because we're coming up on eight o'clock here. Um, this question was, could you say more about what was found in the Patapsco Valley State Park? Uh, so that was found by, uh, by an archeology span enthusiast who was hiking and, and looked down and picked up a, a stone projectile point. And it seems to be a Dalton point, which is a late Paleo-Indian style, uh, probably around 11,000 years old. Uh, I, th I think it's made out of rhyolite, which is a, a or metarhyolite, which is a metamorphosed volcanic rock. Uh, the closest sources are in uh, Thurmont, Maryland, at like, the Catoctin Mountains. So that's my best, uh, my best initial interpretation of that projectile point is that it's likely around 11,000 years old. Okay, well, thank you very, very much. This was a very interesting presentation. Um, and uh, let's see, do you have anything else to say, Patty, or? Sorry, here I am, I unmuted myself. No, this is fascinating. There's a lot of data. Um, um, I need to delve into this some more, but um, this is a really interesting presentation and we're very, very grateful to Zach for sharing his knowledge with us. Yes, oh, thank yeah. you very much. I Thanks just... again for having me. I, I, it's my favorite topic to discuss paleo Indian archeology. span So I appreciate uh, your attendance and your participation. Okay, well, thank you again. Thank you. Everybody have a good evening. Uh, I just, a few things in the